All right, well, thank you, um, Kirsten, for your gracious introduction, but mostly thank you to Bill. Now, I'm gonna tell you that this presentation is Bill Browning's presentation. He put it together over a period of about a year and a half, and in doing that, he must have interviewed every uh, relevant uh, figure and player in Northern Virginia who would know anything about the subject we're gonna talk about tonight, which is um, what to do about the burgeoning population of white-tailed white deer and uh, to explain their impact on our, our green spaces and what some of the options might be. Um, Bill t undertook this because uh, the master naturalists were aware that Arlington County about, I'm going to use a round number here, maybe 12 years ago, talked about doing a census of deer population, thinking about this problem. And the Bambi people erupted in outrage at the thought of controls that might be placed on deer. And and the reaction was so strong that staff and county board really backed off. And um, in discussing that history, uh, the executive group or the, the group really working on initiatives for the master naturalist realized there was a need to do a lot of public education about why this is an issue and what kinds of things um, might be <laughs> as we say, humane. Um, and so I'm gonna tell you that yesterday I listened to uh, a Zoom meeting, a Zoom webinar that the Audubon Society offered by the humane gardener, Nancy Lawson. And uh, I'm, I'm sort of trying to absorb the Zen of gardening in, uh, how shall I say, in, uh, yeah, in celebration of uh, the rabbits and the deer, I confess that um, deer have been the bane of my personal garden for, uh, I would say, 23 years. Notice I have a date on that. I remember the summer I went outside and wondered what peculiar insect might have been eating all the leaves off the violets and thinking that was very strange. Only uh, a few days later, I saw the little hoof prints in the, in the wet uh, soil and realized I was thinking the wrong, um, down the wrong lines. Um, so uh, uh, we have a herd of deer that bed down regularly uh, directly behind our home where there's a little um, unused space. Bill and I live in the same neighborhood. He, seems the, he sees the same herd of deer, and of course, they're beautiful. My other little anecdote I'll share with you is um, we have Dutch friends, and one was sitting in my living room, uh, and this I believe was in the fall or the winter, and she looked out and said, Joanne, there is a very large mammal in your backyard. <laughs> and it was a 12 point buck, um, so she's right. Uh, we've, we've had um, bucks uh, fighting each other in our backyard, and, and we're all very aware. They're beautiful animals. Um, I, you know, I, um, I confess I grew up in Texas, and, uh, and deer were part of my, uh, my family's culture. I, I grew up eating venison on a regular basis. Um, and so, uh, you know, I have that sort of relationship to them. Um, they, they are remarkable in their uh, agility, uh, their ability to run swiftly, 20, 30 miles an hour is nothing, 30, 40 miles an hour. Uh, their ability to jump is remarkable. Um, we know that eight feet is what's recommended. I've heard they can clear nine um, and that they can jump as far as 25 feet if they really want to. Uh, they are big man. They are big animals. A male uh, buck can weigh up to 400 pounds. So uh, females are naturally smaller, but they are the largest herbivore that we have in Virginia. The largest remaining herbivore, uh, I should say. And um, you know, our uh, their their story, their population story, is a very interesting one. 
Um, we don't know how many deer were here when uh, people left Europe and uh, came to settle the United States, but you can see on this graph uh, where the estimates lie. And uh, with the removal of the forests and the hunting um, and um, population, um, human population increases, uh, the population of deer declined steadily in the United States and, and the East in particular. Uh, and um, by the early 20th century, that population was at, at a nadir. And uh, deer were, were um, basically missing in our wild places. Uh, so much so that in the 30s and the 40s, uh, deer were actually reintroduced into Virginia. Uh, for the hunting population. And they were brought here uh, from neighboring Midwestern states to replenish the herd. Um, so all of that said, uh, hunting is no longer the sport that it was. And uh, other, um, other circumstances really have uh, generated the very perfect environment uh, for deer to flourish, and that is the suburbs. Um, so the explosion in population uh, has really brought us over here. Now let's see, I wanna get rid of the box where I see all of you. Yeah, let's, let's follow the cursor. Here we are, so you can see what a, a very rapid rise uh, in population we've enjoyed. And part of that has simply to do with the fecundity. Uh, a doe, you know, the average life span is probably somewhere between um, four and five years, uh, but a, a fecund uh, doe can uh, have twins and can be productive uh, for as many as nine or 10 years. So herds can double in size annually. That's, that's an exponential growth, right? And uh, of course, does primarily have twins. Uh, so you can see uh, where we go. All right, this is where I have to do this. And uh, suburbia is the kind of edge that uh, deer prefer and there's really very little to deter them. So um, here we are, and here they are. Uh, they roam into our public spaces, uh, the fragmented areas, uh, and when they, uh, they, they are doing that, looking for food. They're, they're looking for uh, sustenance because there are simply more of them than uh, there is food in the natural spaces. All right, so take a look here at um, some pictures that try and capture uh, the quantity of food it takes to support these ungulates, right? Uh, this is a master naturalist, Todd Minners, who is uh, holding up approximately five to six, five to seven pounds of vegetation, which is the daily uh, diet of a deer. And um, that, would, that would add up over a year to a ton of vegetation. So uh, you can't really show a ton of leaves, but uh, the diagram on the right is an effort to show something like uh, what a ton of leaves might look like over a year's time, right? So um, now in Arlington, believe it or not, we have approximately, and this is just an estimate, 800 acres of natural land. So let's think about what that natural land would be. A lot of it runs along the river, along the Potomac River, so along the George Washington Parkway. Uh, some of that actually occurs in a very small section of Arlington Cemetery. And then the rest, the rest of it um, takes, you know, uh, consumes our, our 
uh, county and our regional parks. And um, 800 acres is, is what we estimate. And the going estimate for green space of that sort is that it would support 15 to 20 deer in a square mile. So uh, since 640 acres uh, make up a square mile, in Arlington, ecologically speaking, we can't support much more than 20 to 30 deer. All right. So here we are. We've created a perfect <coughs> storm. Greg Zell was um, Alonso Abogadas's predecessor as the natural resources manager um, in Arlington County. And uh, I suspect that this Arlington Magazine article uh, was something generated about the time the county began to think about this earlier. Now, um, why does this really matter? Well, all of that vegetation that they're consuming on a daily basis uh, renders the forest uh, effectively empty. You can see on the left here in this slide uh, what a healthy understory would look like. One of the points that Nancy Lawson made yesterday uh, as she talked about being a humane gardener is how because we are such a mobile society and so many of us have moved from one place to the next. I, for example, grew up in Texas where the woods have a very different look. We don't really know what our forests should look like doing. And um, consequently, we look at woods that look like this and we think, well, that's appropriate. But it's not. This is an over-browsed forest. And it looks that way because the deer have come in and they've taken down everything up to a very visible line right here, right? So um, over-browsed forests do not replicate themselves. And this has um, an impact on other animals. So, um, I'm a birder and uh, I am very aware of uh, the disappearance of three billion birds over my lifetime, actually since I uh, came an adult. And uh, approximately 50% of the birds that we've lost are in the songbird category. We've actually done very well with water birds because there's a group of people who've used the duck stamp program and the ducks unlimited people who have raised money and have seen that uh, the habitat those birds need has been preserved. But the wood thrush doesn't have any advocates uh, that are working at the political front for them. And um, wood thrushes nest quite often at a level <clears throat> that would be affected by deer browse, as are these two absolutely charming, wonderful warblers that are local okay. nesters, um, like, the, like the wood thrush, the black and white, and the black-throated blue warbler. Uh, they actually build their nests down low. Birds all have different preferred habitats. Uh, the brown thrasher actually uh, does its, its browsing for food, uh, but it, it, needs, uh, it needs cover as it does that. And we have here a picture of a very large sparrow called a towhee, eastern towhee. And all of these nest at this lower level and will also perch on smaller branches uh, like the um, wood peewee 
uh, another bird uh, that whose numbers have been disappearing. And they'll use that as their perch as they fly out to, uh, to get insects. Now, when we go back, if we go back to this picture here, when we don't have the understory, we don't have the insects that live in that understory, right? And uh, so we, we've created, to some extent, a food desert um, in that sense for those birds, as well as taking their cover and their hopes of finding a place to build their nests. Um, here are two more birds. I, I did hear an oven bird this afternoon over at Fort C.F. Smith, and I looked at the vegetation, and it was calling from a hillside that the deer had not yet uh, denuded. So um, again, more species, but it's not only birds that are affected um, by the loss of this cover. Uh, foxes and other small mammals uh, are also uh, affected in their populations. And of course, plants that use the forest floor, such as the spring beauty, and this specialist bee, the spring beauty bee, uh, which can only live uh, off the pollen that that particular plant produces. Uh, all of them are also threatened uh, by the degradation of our forest floor. Hox turtles, have, have uh, any of you ever uh, walked through the woods and seen where the deer have come and uh, nibbled off the may apples? I, uh, as a master naturalist, manage a uh, demonstration garden over at Potomac Overlook. And we, we got may apples in there and uh, Every year, young fawn comes along and, and nibbles them off. Box turtles will eat uh, the mayapple fruit if it's allowed to mature. Uh, so uh, we, it's all connected. And um, deer are a sort of keystone species in this. And uh, much like the story of wolves, I, I think, possibly you all would be familiar with the story of Yellowstone in which the elk um, population had gotten out of control because wolves had been removed as a keystone species there. And uh, it took the reintroduction of wolves to restore uh, the riparian areas and uh, certain certain trees uh, that had completely disappeared uh, from that. So uh, the stories the stories are are similar. All right, I'm looking to get my cursor over where I can find it. There we go. Um, the piece of the forest story that I didn't really talk about is um, and I, and I don't want to lose it before we move on. And Bill, if you have other things that you'd like to jump in and add here, I'd like to welcome you to do that. But I know in, um, in my garden, I have watched the deer in particular going after oak trees. And one of the things that the deer do is browse down the new seedlings. So there are people thinking about this issue, who are concerned that we will not have re regeneration in our woods if the deer continue at their level of population right now. So, um, all right, let's turn from the woods to the parks um, and, and our populated areas. Um, no dogs allowed in the playground. You see the sign here, <sighs> right here. <laughs> And yet we're, we're ready to let deer in. And of course, deer, um, deer can bring feces. They leave feces behind. Um, that can be an issue just like dogs. Oop. And um, this is the kind of destruction that happens in your garden as well as in mine. This is one of those beautiful liatris plants that Alyssa talked about the butterflies loving. Well, the deer like it too. Thank you, Kirsten, for that 
um, very clear shot. Um, I was given a white oak tree by the county as part of its um, efforts to repopulate the, uh, the former Arlingtonians for Clean Environment, now Eco Action Arlington. Uh, as you may know, permits you to apply for uh, uh, two inch caliper trees that are brought and planted professionally on your property. And I was given a beautiful white oak, which I duly watered and cared for, but during the winter time, the deer, which um, are, their antlers are more or less growing uh, much of the year. And as they grow, they have a velvet on them. It becomes very itchy that they're eager to get off. So they're looking for places to rub it. And here you have uh, a tree that's been girdled just as mine was uh, by deer rub. Again, uh, three trees over at the Potomac Overlook uh, demonstration garden have had to be enclosed uh, for the same reason, because the deer had come along and, um, and damaged portions of them. So, and yet uh, deer still may not have enough food with all that we have to offer them. Uh, David Howell is a master naturalist who caught this image of a deer in the fall uh, with a rib cage showing through just at the time when she should be putting fat on. And again, Steve Young is um, a park steward at Glen Carlin Park. And he shows the same story. So uh, Bill has spoken with um, state biologists and uh, they tell him that deer can manage uh, in fair to poor health for quite a long time. But it's very possible that the vegetation they're consuming in our gardens isn't really meeting their nutritional requirements. And uh, the other thing that the congregation of deer uh, brings about is deer pandemics, if you will. Uh, so uh, the, the density of deer contributes to spread of a disease that is on its way to Virginia, uh, chronic wasting disease. Now this is um, a disease a little like mad cow disease, one of those prion diseases. And the anticipation is that this is likely to be uh, the most serious deer, uh, problem for deer and elk and moose uh, in the United States um, over the next century or so. And you can see in this legend here where we have uh, chronic wasting disease that has already approached our population, uh, our deer herds. And um, there's no evidence that this is transmissible to humans at this point. Uh, but of course, we, that's one of those questions we really don't know. And it's another reason why in some places, um, and I, I believe it's another reason why venison doesn't show up on our supermarket shelves, uh, because it's not been possible to certify the health of that source of meat. All right. Well, can I interrupt one, one, yeah, one second here? Do. Yeah, yeah, please do. It's not a, I don't think it's on the commercial grocery stores because there's no real marketing company that can raise a bunch of deer. It's not safe. To, if, you, if you're a private hunter and you kill a deer, the only way it's safe to eat is if you, if you have it tested for the CWD after the fact, after it's dead. Right. Right. So we have a marketability problem. Well, so, um, you know, that, that brings us to ask the big question. How do we get things back into balance? Um, how, do we, how do we try and strive for balance uh, in, our, uh, in our public spaces as well as our private spaces? Well, we know that um, these other predators are not gonna do the job. 
right? They, these, these predators have been extirpated um, from Virginia and it's unlikely that we will see um, our human populations tolerating their reintroduction. Um, I just think it's, it's, uh, it's unlikely. Uh, we know there's the occasional report of a cougar. We know wolves have been moving closer. Um, other possible predators for deer include coyote. They primarily would um, possibly attack a very young fawn uh, as part of a pack. Uh, but by and large, none of the remaining uh, predators is effective. And uh, mostly when we find they've been eating deer, they've been scavenging deer that were already dead. So uh, you probably are familiar with uh, some of the journalism that's been done uh, covering contraception and steril sterilization attempts. And Bill's research um, and many interviews tells us that this is simply not uh, a good option for us. So there's several reasons why uh, that's the case. And one is that um, this is really hard on the deer. Another is that it's very minimally successful for a great deal of effort and for a great deal of expense. Uh, so a lot of the projects that um, have been attempted fail to check survival rates and deer are prone to what's called capture myopathy. And that's known as a white, that's also known as white muscle disease. So this is a situation where the deer is so stressed out by the capture, restraint, and handling that there's a buildup of lactic acid in the deer's muscles and bloodstream. And it actually changes the pH of the body and affects the heart. And uh, ultimately it can lead to death by heart failure. Um, now some places have tried using tubal ligation and Bill, do you want to tell us a little bit about that? So the effort? tubal ligation story I'm familiar with is at Cornell University. And Cornell, Ithaca had police capturing the deer and volunteer veterinarians um, tying the tubes for the female deer. And what they found in, in Ithaca was that it, they still, the, the female deer still went into estrus regularly. And I don't know whether their cycle is a month. I don't know how long the cycle is, but they kept going into estrus and it kept attracting more male deer. So the population actually grew. Um, there's some other sterilization programs that have been tried. There's been talk about maybe feeding deer, something that would sterilize them. But the problem is on the female side, you have to do it every month or every, every, regular, every regular period. And on the male deer, unless you do it to every male deer, one remaining uh, potent male is willing to impregnate a whole herd. So it's DJF does not approve of these methods for management purposes. They'll approve it for research to try to find a better technique, but not for management. And we're using the acronym DGIF, that stands oh. for Department of Game and Inland Fisheries. That's the Virginia department that is tasked with- Sorry about that. The management, yeah, yeah. Right. So um, what, uh, what, is, uh, what is sanctioned by DJIF are, are hunting programs. And um, it, for, in many of them, uh, the venison is actually used for organizations uh, such as Hunters for the Hungry uh, in Maryland. And Montgomery County, has actually given over 300,000 pounds of food to the Capital Area Food Bank. Um, and the uh, 
options for hunting deer in an urban setting are, uh, are several. So uh, in some cases, police shooters are used or other professional deer managers who are dedicated uh, to this task. Uh, sometimes managed hunts are set up. I know we've heard about those being conducted in Fairfax County parks in the past. They require a much larger area to safely operate than most of our parks um, can promise in Arlington and the city of Alexandria for that matter. And then bow hunting is uh, yet another one. And bow hunting is the safest option for use in a residential area. I have seen uh, places in Occoquan where uh, this is set up. And I know that there's uh, bow hunting at Huntley Meadows where I go birding regularly or did before this virus uh, kept us indoors. And uh, typically a stand is set up and the, the shooting is done from the stand um, so that arrows that may go astray are shot straight to the ground. And since Virginia began tracking hunting injuries in 1959, about bystanders have ever been injured by an archer hunting deer anywhere in the, in the Commonwealth of Virginia. So uh, the program can and, and has been managed safely. Um, so we might wonder about um, non-lethal wounding. And um, there, there is a certain amount of, um, of non-recovery rates. Um, a lot of the information is old uh, and current studies show that modern archery methods uh, document very low wounding rate, somewhere between two and 18%, depending on the study. Fairfax County's figures, again, are much lower, three to 9%. So the Fairfax County program has been in place uh, since 1998. Let's get to that slide. I'm sorry, my cursor periodically disappears on me. Um, and they use all of these different techniques. Um, there is a great deal of collaboration that uh, is involved in setting it up. The impetus for beginning the program was the uh, tragic death of a 49-year-old librarian the year before who was driving down Old Dominion Drive and I believe it was a buck darted out in front of her and smashed into her windshield and killed her. And uh, it, was, it was decided that, that something needed to be done for public safety. And um, hunters who um, enlist in this program have to pass regular exams that, sh that show their skills and they have to recertify. Um, Bill has uh, chatted with a number of them and he says he recertifies every two years uh, with a proficiency test and um, there are statewide requirements as well that are put in place to manage these programs. Bill, anything else that I might have missed? No, that's all covered. I mean, th I think the, the important thing here is Fairfax County will say they have not had an incident to a person, to a human being, or to a pet in the parks since they've been hunting with modern archery tackle, 1998. Zero is a pretty good number for safety. Zero is a very good number. And uh, so Bill has painstakingly assembled as well uh, a lot of information about what's going on in the surrounding jurisdictions. So take a look at what Montgomery, now Montgomery County, of course, has a lot of, um, agricultural land and a lot more green space. 
and they've been able to they were able to harvest in one year 5700 deer um, through again a combined program of archery shotgun police, sharp, police sharpshooting and in the parks um, around them they have been able to document lower incidents of traffic incidents and encounters with deer. Uh, in Prince George's, uh, there's a little bit of bow hunting, otherwise police sharpshooters uh, do that. Public safety is a top priority. The deer are removed safely, discreetly, humanely. We've talked about Fairfax. You can see that um, they got nearly a thousand deer and I'm assuming that's in one year. Uh, because all of the rest of these are annual. And Loudoun County, again, a much less urban county than Arlington uh, or Alexandria, um, is able to, to take a, a good amount and, and really uh, do a much better job of controlling their population. Uh, the, the numbers in Arlington, um, as you can see, are very low because uh, we are not permitted, uh, there's an ordinance against discharging a weapon within a 100 yards um, of a public road, a public building, a private residence, uh, or somebody else's property even. So that's pretty limiting. And um, it's not entirely clear, but probably um, those 13 deer are taken from a few of the larger private properties remaining for recreational purposes in the county. And uh, they just have some quiet culling that goes on. And um, as you can probably guess that we have a couple of golf courses in Arlington. So uh, Rock Creek Park also has a history um, of managing deer. And uh, it's interesting to note that before 1960, they simply didn't see deer in the park, but they stopped counting them by the 1990s because there were too many to count and nearly a hundred a square mile just 10, 10 years ago. So remember that the carrying capacity, which is the technical term for what an ecosystem can, can um, support in good health is 15 to 20. Um, so the public, uh, a public process took them to a deer management plan about eight years ago. And again, that was um, in an effort to support restoration of uh, the understory and promote healthy forest practices. And they've been able to remove uh, under 100 deer every year for the last three years. Uh, using firearm experts that uh, operate at night. So again, without any safety incidents. So, um, you know, we are looking to talk to groups such as this one, uh, to civic associations, to garden clubs, to um, other uh, Rotarians, whoever might be interested in hearing this story because doing nothing right now means that we're actually um, favoring deer over all those other animals that we talked about earlier. Uh, the birds, the mammals, the reptiles. And if we do nothing, we are going to uh, find in the next generations that um, not only our forests, but of course our public and our private landscapes uh, will suffer, uh, our taxpayer money will be wasted, um, ergo the, the tree in my yard that had to be replaced, um, trees on uh, the, the, the nearest large public street that were put in and uh, suffered again from the deer rub. And uh, what's needed is for us to do something about this. Um, so, uh, we are uh, looking to master gardeners and master naturalists to take this conversation uh, to your neighbors and to your friends 
your family and uh, to uh, put us in touch so that we can uh, share this education. Uh, I think I should have probably started this uh, evening out by saying this, uh, I am doing exactly what we want all of you to do. I'm trying out um, an educational initiative uh, for the very first time. I'm taking the show on the road, but it's uh, something that uh, is, is what we model, we want to model for all master gardeners and master naturalists uh, to do, which is to go out and do education in our community. Uh, so uh, let's make sure we aren't feeding the deer. Let's make sure um, we're uh, not helping them acclimatize to being comfortable. And um, we will have a natural resources plan that's uh, under development and we'll have an opportunity to address this in that uh, particular plan and in that process. So the other last piece that you can do is to uh, talk to uh, your county board member and uh, association um, representatives about this. I know Bill and the president of the Master Naturalists have met with some of the county board members at this point, and they are receptive to this conversation. But of course, with the many competing interests for their time and attention, especially in this time of pandemic, um, it's going to be important uh, for us to get this ball up in the air and keep it there for a while so that we can make a difference. Um, Alder Leopold had uh, a bit of a, a revelation uh, uh, perhaps, perhaps not everyone is uh, familiar with Aldo Leopold, but we could probably call him the father, uh, one of the fathers of American conservation movement. And um, he, he recognized that um, the deer could have this destructive impact on a mountain, a range pulled down by too many deer may fail of replacement in as many decades. We don't want that to happen. So we're grateful to you for um, taking time to be part of this tonight. I'm gonna quit sharing my screen uh, after showing you the Armin website, which hopefully all of you are familiar with, but um, let's open this up. All right. Let me pull back out of this, which will take just a second, and I will stop sharing my screen. All right, so are there any questions or things that you would like to, to share or stories you want to tell? Everyone seems muted. Ah, let's, can we unmute? I'm sorry, I don't have my video on. I'd like to know what kind of a public education campaign it would take to be able to move people to the point of accepting this kind of control. It's a really good question, Kirsten. To which there are no answers yet. We gotta so start do, somewhere. What do, you, what do you envision? Me? Yes. I don't know. I, I envisioned someday walking through Potomac Overlook Park and seeing signs saying stay off the, stay on the trails because there's deer hunting going on and there's a stand in there. There's plenty of room there to do this program. I think it's a real big stretch for Arlington public to accept this stuff. Um, but Armin's job is to educate. We've talked about the deer problem for a few decades now and it's not getting any better. They're not going to eat themselves out of house and home. They're going to, they, they will survive, but the little, little butterflies and little birds, they won't. Well, I think that there's, I think it's a discussion that needs to be had with the people who care about this topic, because as we all know, there's a great deal of objection of, 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 um, of concern about Bambi and about, you know, the, the impression. So, so the we've given some, Kirsten, there is, and we, we expected a lot of grief when we started giving this presentation. 
This is probably the 19th or 20th presentation we've given in Arlington County. And we've only heard one small concern, and that's whether or not the hunting program would use the venison productively. We haven't heard anything about protecting poor little Bambi yet. We might, but we haven't heard it yet. And our, our um, focus so far has been, would you say, has it been in one part of the county geographically rather than another? Probably, yes. It's probably mostly North, North Arlington because that's frankly where the bigger problem is. Yeah. And, more, and there's more green space. There's more green space, there's more deer. Yeah. I can also say the comment on the county board, we did just about when the COVID crisis hit, we, we had a meeting with Libby Garvey and she was very receptive. And she said, you need to get this to the other county board members. And it was, it was right about at the time when Eric Gutschel got sick. So we never got to him before he unfortunately passed away. But we did have Zoom meetings or Microsoft Teams meetings with the other three county board members. And they were all very receptive. They all have different questions and concerns and recognize that this is a public education problem. He's kind of wandering around. So what? That's what he needs to do. Yeah, that's why I'm not, I mean, you know, it's why he doesn't bother me. I've unmuted everybody so could, in hopes that you would ask questions. <laughs> or, um, any any uh, reflections on the presentation would be good too. I don't, I, have one. I don't have a question, but I I live in in North Farlington, and I have seen lots of deer. Yeah, oh, there deer there, including um, one that walked down the middle of the par the parking lot, looked very ill, was very emaciated, mm -hmm. and ended up you know walking away. I mean, we my dog and I were five feet away from this deer didn't even you know react to us at all mm -hmm. and then um was reported on the fairlington listserv that the deer had you know people saw it all over the place and eventually it just lay down and died so i think that wasting disease that's why i was asking about that bill um, so so there's no reports of the chronic wasting disease this far east yet so maybe it, it was just starving maybe it was just starving yeah, you could oh, really no. see, you could see the bones. I mean, it was so skinny. So, so the thing with the chronic wasting disease, when it starts to um, sh show the symptoms, it's very obvious. They start frothing at the mouth. They walk around in circles, very confused. Um, you can find videos of it online if you're curious. But um, the problem with the CWD is they have it for a couple of weeks, just like COVID. They can mm -hmm. have it for a couple of weeks and be asymptomatic. Mm -hmm. So you can hunt a deer and eat the venison, and the venison could be uh, laced with CWD, the, the meat could be unsafe and you wouldn't know. And do we know that it affects humans' health? No, we don't know. There's a professor in Minnesota, I, I know the name because I've read about him, but he's also been commenting on the um, news about COVID. It's infectious disease specialist, Michael Osterfeld or Osterholm or something like that. Mm -hmm. And he's worried about it jumping to humans, but it hasn't yet. One of the issues with it jumping to humans is they think there might be a 30 year, incub up to a 30 year incubation period. So yeah. it's one of those great unknowns. It's like the um, spongioencephala, what was it? Bovine spongioencephala? Could mad be, cow. I'm not familiar mad with that. Cow. I still oh. can't give blood because we lived in Belgium. Oh, that's years. the mad cow, yeah. The mad be cow. Because of that, um, that concern about the uh, length of. This is compared to, the CWD is, con is compared to mad cow quite often. There's a couple other deer diseases that we didn't write up for this presentation. One, EHG or encephalic, I, I can never pronounce these names, even if I can see it written in front of me. Very complicated name, but. But I don't think they're an issue in the East yet, right? Don't know. I believe, oh, okay. And, and that's one reason why I believe if you are a hunter, uh, Elena, you're, you're asked to cook your venison now, not serve it deliciously rare. Yeah. My, so, my... so the other tidbit that I haven't shared with Joanne yet, what one of the wildlife biologists told me at the Master Naturalist Conference last September is that to make the, if venison is tainted with CWD, to weigh, the way to make it safe 
there was some absurd amount of time it had to be cooked at a thousand degrees before you could kill the virus. Thousand degrees. Oh my. Okay. So I would, yeah. you know, if, if, if you have a private hunter donating venison meat, ask if it's been tested. All the way stations that manage hunters, where the hunters are supposed to bring their kills to be tested, will test it for CWD. They'll get weighed, the tag will be checked, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Now, I'll, I'll be the first one to admit that most, most hunters probably do that, but there's probably a few out there who don't. Mm -hmm. mm. Okay, thank you. This is a very interesting presentation. Really appreciate it. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Bill has put untold hours, as you can tell, in Just mass ask my wife. How <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's become a bit of a passion for me, a bit yeah. of a cause. I mean, I grew up in North. I grew, I grew up in New Hampshire, where in a family where there were no guns. Um, we were. My mother was an avid. avid I don't know what the right word is, but she just wouldn't have anything to do with guns in the household. And my dad grew up in the depression and he grew up hunting for food. So it was a little bit of a tension, but there was no hunting in our, and I did not have a hunting um, environment in my growing up. Went to college in New Hampshire and had a roommate who was a forestry major who was a hunter. And I can remember having arguments with this roommate of mine about how hunting was cruel and how it was mean to the deer. And I was, I was, very far on the left end of the political mm -hmm. spectrum. I've come around on that. I value the ecological services that hunters now provide to us right now. We live in an environment where the deer are gonna rule this world and we're not gonna have a forest in another generation or two. Right, and we have a food shortage. So the idea of being able and to- there's a, lot of, there's a lot of benefits to culling deer for, for many, many reasons. Right. But if you look around, if you walk through any of the neighborhood parks in Northern Virginia, and you look around, you can see a long way through the forest because there's no understory. Try to find a 10 or 12 foot tree that's gonna take over for one of the canopy trees that's about to fall in five or 10 years. Mm -hmm. It's not there. All right. oh. There's somebody with their hand raised, Cheryl. Oh, Cheryl. Who's Cheryl? I don't know, but her hand is raised on the thing. Yeah, I see that, thank you. We can't see you, but we hear you, Cheryl, if you um, have a question. I lowered it, see if she's, huh. All right, perhaps it was inadvertent. That happens. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. You are very, very welcome. Now, friends, uh, you know, I've been watching Bill do this presentation for, I don't know, five, six months. I've gone along with him, but this is my first time to give it. And, uh, you know, it takes a while for a presentation to be something that you absorb, but it's something you can do as well. So keep that in mind. You as Master Gardeners all have many, many gifts. Not everyone has the gift of, um, of speaking. Um, and of course, none of us has uh, the kind of mastery that Bill has developed because he developed this himself. But, um, but do keep in mind that um, this is something, this is a, this is a, uh, a skill set that is open to you. And uh, if that feels challenging, take the oh, challenge and run here, with it. Here's Cheryl's question. Cheryl has a question. Do, do deer favor native plants over non-native plants since they are native to US? If so, the empty space they leave also leave the forest more vulnerable to invasives taking over the forest. Um, Cheryl's absolutely right. The deer do prefer the native plants. They evolved with them over the centuries. And what comes up behind them is not something they prefer. Um, if I could get deer to in eat English ivy as a first choice, I'd be very happy. But they aren't trainable. But Cheryl makes a good point. They eat the native plants. The, those are the first ones to go out of our forest. And they eat the hostas second. <laughs> right. And Alonzo's given us plant in one of my park restoration efforts where I work, Alonzo has given me plants and he says, oh, the deer won't eat this. Well, they do. Yeah. 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 Do keep in mind that those lists of, you know, deer resistant plants is just that, you know, it's, it's what most deer might not eat, but a, a young deer will try almost anything. And, and we'll browse um, and taste things. So I can so see a few, a few people are starting to sign off. I wanna say thank you to everyone for showing up tonight. 
And if you have a civic association or a group of friends or a book club you want us to speak to, let us know. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. you know, I, I do want to come back to my earlier question, which is that what does moving ahead look like? You know, does it, um, I know you're doing awareness, a really great job of building awareness, but what does it look like to move forward into the next step? So what's, I can tell, I don't know, but what is happening right now is I know for, for, I can't tell you the sequence of events, but the Arlington County Parks and Recs Department is embarking on finding a private company to do a deer census. Sure. And okay. the, the county the board has directed, from what I hear, and this is all third hand information, the county board has directed them to do that, told them not to worry about the money, but to find an outside unbiased consultant to do the work, to not try to do the work themselves. And that's that, that's, that's the next step that I know about. Yeah. Well, that's something. Okay. Yeah. So don't buy your, um, don't go buy your modern tackle, uh, archery tackle yet, Kirsten. <laughs> but when you do, we'll set you up in my, our backyards. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. All right. Anything else? Nope. Nope. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You're Thank you. very, very welcome. Yeah. Send us your civic association contacts if you can.